Zero. Welcome to another Founder Wisdom Pod. We have Sonia Shekun with us today. She is the founder at Law Offices of Sonia Shekun. She's a lawyer uh, in technology, media, telecommunication work. Uh, so she, she concluded huge uh, satellital deal in the past. Uh, she was uh, educated in the UK, uh, spent some time at Qatar Airways, which is a huge and interesting company. So today we're going to discuss about all of that. This podcast is brought to you by podpire.com. If you want to start scale, be invited to podcasts, go to podpire.com. We help you monetize podcasting. Sonia, welcome to the pod. Tell me a bit more about yourself and what you're up to nowadays. So great to meet you, Charles, and to see you and to speak with your audience. Um, well, as, as you introduced me, I, my name is Sonia. I am American. I'm from New York. And I like to say that because I have spent a lot of time abroad. So people get confused between my last name, the fact that I've spent a lot of time abroad, uh, and they wonder where I'm actually from. So I was born in New York City in Manhattan. And um, I, uh, these days, to answer your question directly, I'm spending a lot of time building my solo practice, which is, as you said, the law offices of Sonia Shekhun Esquire. Um, and uh, I am a high level generalist, but I have worked in many, uh, oh, I wonder what happened to my camera. Ah, let me start again. There you go. I'm a high level generalist, meaning that I have a huge experience in corporate and commercial uh, law and, and commercial transactions on a, not just in a, when people hear that I've worked in Qatar and Bahrain, they think, oh, I only work on deals that are governed by the laws of uh, Qatar and Bahrain, but actually I have worked on a global basis. So it's very confusing because my career has been so unorthodox uh, and my experience has been so unorthodox. So I like to try to contextualize it like that. So I do cross-border transactions. I'm qualified in New York State. I have a lot of education and a lot of experience. Right. And what did you work at working at big companies such as Qatar Airways and Al Jazeera? Okay. So um, I I have always been a legal advisor to these companies. And uh, because of my work ethic, um, my uh, I have this kind of fear. I don't know where it comes from, maybe from private school that we had deadlines to always uh, meet uh, and we were always afraid to miss them. So I have this kind of innate need to get my work done on time, all of it, and never to be late. So uh, because of that, um, I have a, a huge ability to do a lot of work on time. I'm rarely late. I don't think I've ever been late with a big project. So I have advised on uh, a huge range of matters. I mean, I couldn't, I would be here all day if I told you the kind of things. But for example, um, so I started off in Bahrain in, in the company that no longer exists, but is now OSN in Dubai. So if you go to Dubai or anywhere in the Middle East and stay in a hotel and turn on your TV, you'll see OSN, which is Orbit Showtime Network, which is the new iteration of the first company I worked for which was a pay satellite, pan-Arab pay satellite TV company. So um, why I'm mentioning that is because um, I uh, originally started off as a technology lawyer, uh, working in new, new tech satellites. Um, and this was in 2004 to 2008. So before SpaceX, before commercial uh, satellites were a thing, and I was writing a lot about it. And I always used to wonder like, gee, I wonder why uh, commercial satellite isn't taking off. There's so many uses and there's so many uh, like positive uses. And now of course it's it has taken off. Um, so I, I started off in technology, media and telecoms. And when you work in a back office for a company like Orbit or later on Al Jazeera, there are lots of uh, really interesting and complex contracts that you work on. But, but for example, license agreements with uh, with um, content providers like um, 
you know, companies that make make movies or music videos, you would license from Warner Brothers or Disney, for example. Uh, so you would have content to put on the, sh on the channels or space capacity. Uh, if you have a satellite and you need to rent the space to uh, somebody who might want to uh, have a satellite channel, like if you decided to, to, to have a, your own satellite platform, you could rent space capacity and uh, fix it that way. What else? Sponsorship agreements. Later on, I dealt with a lot of bigger contracts because I had proven myself. So uh, I did the bar the tripartite sponsorship agreement between uh, Jet Airways, Barclays Center in Brooklyn, and Kasher Airways. Uh, so that was like to have the Kasher Airways uh, banners on the in the basketball um, court. Um, and what else? Like so many different kinds of contracts and new like projects for new channels abroad i i had a new channel to uh to set up in turkey a new channel to set up in east africa so lots of different uh, really interesting contracts all around the world not just in Bahrain and Qatar. and what lessons did you take from that that you're currently bringing to your current law practice that you're always going to be learning. You will never know everything and that you always have to have a student's mind. Like, um, so now uh, I'm coming up to my two year period where I have to re like take a uh, re register. And in that two year period, you have to do continuing like legal education uh, courses. And I've been doing a lot of them lately. So I don't have to rush to do them uh, before the registry registration date. And the theme that has been coming up in this uh, in these over and over again is um, the importance of not being a jerk and being willing to learn. You know, like you get further along in business, whether you're a lawyer or you're negotiating a deal, if you're nice, uh, as opposed to you come in and you act like some jerk screaming and yelling. And I have written about that also. also. But I heard it again echoed from my colleagues, echoed by my colleagues. Um, just, you know, always to bring a student's mind that even if you're a senior person in your position, as I am, I, I qualified in 2008. Uh, so that's what, uh, 16 years ago. Uh, I still need to learn stuff. There's always going to be stuff to learn. And you should always be willing to learn, to read, to ask questions and not be afraid to look uh, ignorant or, you know. Nowadays, who do you target as clients? Um, well, uh, I try to target people who are in the satellite industry, uh, people who are in the tech industry, new tech, um, corporate and commercial, anybody trying to do business in the Middle East specifically, which is where I spent uh, you know, because doing business in the Middle East is not just, oh, I, I was there for 16 years. It's uh, really having a lot of the soft skills that you need to be able to succeed um, without antagonizing people or offending people. So um, in New York, obviously, where I'm licensed, but also uh, abroad in the Middle East. How do you target these clients? Is it organic traffic or do you reach out to them? A little bit of both, uh, you know, um, I'm trying to enter the Saudi market because that's heating up. Uh, although even though I live next to Saudi Arabia for 15 years, because Bahrain and Qatar are right next to Saudi Arabia, it was so closed for a long time uh, to tourists that you really couldn't visit. So um, Saudi is heating up. I'm trying to learn more about it. I'm trying to get people interested here to guide them uh, to setting a business there. Why do you think the market is heating up and how is selling uh, in these parts of the world different from selling in the US? Well, okay, so you mentioned Apollo. You know, Apollo is great for Americans because it's no nonsense, it's very direct, okay? And you can like start off your uh, your cold calling, your business development spiel 
with like a hard sell almost immediately. Okay, that's the American or the North American style, I should say. In the Middle East, you can't do that. You'll turn people off. So it's it's a much more uh, prolonged process. You need to get to know people right away, like slowly. Uh, it has to be social first. Like one of the funny things I always used to chuckle about in the Middle East is like, it takes 20 minutes to say hello uh, between Arabs. They have like 5 million ways to say, hi, how are you? And that's kind of emblematic of <laughs> how they do business. You know, you'll hang out, hang out maybe three or four times before you ever mention business. And so you have to really uh, feel it out. And um, so I ride horses and it's it's a similar analogy. Like you have to really be in tune with the, you know, the animal you're trying to tame or <laughs> not that people are animals but you know it's a kind of a, a psychic connection that you develop with the other person and you feel it and once you feel comfortable then you take the cue from from the target not you don't take the cue you know you don't need the discussion so it's very different in that way it's, it's very protocol oriented and relationship oriented so do you focus in media, telecoms, uh, in terms of who you want to get in front of? And uh, what is your business model? Is it the typical uh, lawyer hourly uh, fee? Well, I mean, I'm very open right now. It depends on uh, what I'm like right now. I have some uh, hourly fee clients. I have some um, clients who are going to pay me on the back end because it's so much work they can't afford. I, I'm doing a litigation right now. Uh, so it's so much work that I you know, get paid on the back end. Uh, I could do a flat fee. It really depends on the needs of the, of the client. And as I said, um, I am a high level generalist. I have uh, an LLM in corporate and commercial law uh, from SOAS in London. And then I have a second LLM in corruption law and governance from the University of Sussex that I got in Doha. So uh, anything to do with the compliance, also I can do data pri data privacy um, matters, um, something called DPAs, which is a real pain in the backside for companies because if you don't, if you're not compliant with the GDPR, the uh, data privacy um, laws in the U EU, it could cost you a lot of money in terms of fines. So uh, I have experience with that, compliance, uh, anti-corruption initiatives, anti-bribery, anti-corruption initiatives. Because again, uh, say your your company branched out and decided, I notice you're in Mexico. So uh, if you were doing business in Mexico and you decided to start paying bribes, um, you could be penalized for, for that. and. Uh, if you don't know that, then it would be very easy to fall foul of the law, the anti-corruption laws in your country uh, and end up maybe even going to jail, certainly paying fines. So um, I handle matters like that also. Um, and in terms of the industries, aviation, obviously, because I've worked in two airlines, not just Kesher Airways, I was seconded to um, Gulf Air and the thing. Uh, telecoms, any kind of regulatory matters, satellite contracts, obviously I can do those uh, with my eyes closed and I really love, I mean, obviously I don't do them with my eyes closed. I keep my eyes wide open, but I'm very comfortable with them. Um, and more and more, I'm doing a little bit of litigation uh, and just straightforward contracts. So I have been writing contracts since 2004, in fact, uh, and I, as I mentioned, I, I have handled a wide range of contracts. So I have put together um, a boot camp, a training boot camp on the Maven platform. I don't know if you know what that is. The Maven Educational, it's Maven HQ. I think it rings a bell, yeah, like the course, right? Yeah, you can do all kinds of courses there. So I do a, a commercially savvy lawyer uh, contract negotiation and drafting boot camp on that, which is uh, very useful. So that's what the students say. It's very useful because um, a lot of lawyers say that they don't learn how to be lawyers in law school. They only learn once they get out into the real world and have to solve real world problems and draft contracts and negotiate with difficult counterparts.
I'm curious for the corruption side of things, um, why is having a clean country and um, attacking folks or uh, suing folks or preventing folks from doing corruption, why is that important for the growth of a country? Uh, you mean if you were to go and do a, a business in another country? Uh, no, as a government, tell us about corruption and the importance of fighting it. Oh, okay. Well, um, well, in the context that I experienced it, if you if you work for a government entity and there are people in there who are corrupt. Uh, and doing all kinds of uh, shady deals within the company um, to, to either sabotage the business. So one of the things I witnessed was um, um, business partners within the company sabotaging uh, the establishment of bureaus abroad. Uh, and why I, I found out I kind of figured out in retrospect that they didn't want that because the last step of one of the final steps of setting up a company abroad, which as you probably know, is getting a corporate uh, bank account. Okay, so you you get your company, you get your tax number, your whatever, uh, you do all the licensing and stuff, and then you get your at the same time your or later you get your corporate bank account. So what those people in I won't name the company because it, you know, I have confidentiality uh, obligations. Um, what my colleagues at the time were doing was sabotaging the establishment of the bureaus abroad so that they could uh, justify taking cash directly to these offices around the world. And they were stealing money. Okay, so money was getting stolen, not just from the company, the company, but from the government. Okay, so, you know, people are stealing money left, right, and center, and there are no, uh, there are no checks and balances. A company or, and or a company will be left bankrupt if everybody feels they can do that, okay? With, uh, there's no transparency, there's no auditing, uh, there's too much trust being given to the, the managers who are interested. So it's important for the trust it's important for the uh, movement of the flow of the economy. If money is getting stolen, uh, I think of one in Ni exa example of the Nigerian airport. It was, uh, I think maybe 15 years ago, Nigeria built a brand new airport in Lagos, but because of the corruption, they couldn't run it properly. So they had this state of the art uh, airport, but no electricity, no AC, no, no, like mud cons because they stole all the money. So <laughs> you can't function because essentially that's what corruption is. Either people paying to get uh, advantages they haven't earned, okay, which then means you're getting at the in the long run a a, a product which is going to be subpar, probably a product or service that's going to be subpar, like lawyers pretending to be lawyers who don't have the real credentials. So. Uh, and I've worked with people like that, you know, who can't who can't draft a contract, who don't understand the law, who can't draft a contract in English or in Arabic or in whatever language, because they're not real lawyers. So that's one kind of question. Uh, another kind is like money just getting stolen, goods being stolen, uh, fake contracts being written for fake services, fake goods, but legitimate uh, account numbers. So you have some shenanigans guy in your company drafting a contract with another corrupt guy in an outside outside company. And it's all for nonsense, but the money is exchanging hands. And maybe they're splitting it at the back end, you know, after the contract is signed. And um, um, also it's like, uh, if money is, is going into pockets of corrupt people and being diverted away from important projects like buildings. Uh, so like the the materials will be subpar, they might replace it with cement that has sand in it. And then five years later, the building collapses. I've seen that happen. 
uh, or you know highways that are supposed to be built and they're being built with subpar material. So uh, it, it has like corruption has a corrosive effect on all aspects of, of society from the top down and side to side. Is is that clear? Yes, it is very poignant stories. Uh, last question: What would be your top three goals for this year? Um, I'd like to get to the Middle East to do a business uh, tour, like a business development tour. I'd like to see Saudi Arabia. That's one goal. Um, I'd like to uh, expand my writing, and I'd like my legal writing. Um, because I have a lot of legal interests and finished my book, uh, The Commercially Savvy Lawyer. And um, I'd like to start helping American or North, Af North American clients by uh, setting up uh, branches or companies in the Middle East. Love it. And where can people find out more about you, Sonia? Uh, well, they can check, check me on LinkedIn or on my website, uh, which is uh, HTTPS dot uh, colon forward slash forward slash shakeonlaw.com um, and on Substack. But LinkedIn and my website are generally, or my email, sonia at shakeonlaw.com. 